welcome to Health Impact Live. I'm Megan Antonelli, your host, and I'm here today with my friend, Colleen Lyons. Colleen is the CIO of Lenox Hill Hospital, and she was actually a speaker at the first Health Impact Conference. I won't say when, but it was a few years ago, maybe maybe 10. Um, if memory serves, Colleen, um, the topic of that session uh, was physician adoption of EHRs. So let's get right to it. Tell me how that's going. It's still going. <laughs> You're exactly right. That was the topic. I remember it distinctly. That that's what we talked about: physician adoption. And there was some sites in the city that were, you know, adopting going to, a, you know, a different EMR. And here I am, ten years later, in the role that I am, and we are doing a major transformation to yet another EHR ourselves. Um, so it never stops. The the puzzle pieces always change the vendors change, the health systems you are part of change, they add, they merge. Um, so it's it's just, it's ongoing every single day that you're in this space, every yeah. day. It is, and it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy to see how much um, how much change there has been in the in the last ten years, which is nice. And of course, you know, the recent recent three years has been sort of an innovation sprint. But when I think back to that time, um, you know, you were one of the only females, you know, certainly on the program. It was you know health IT implementation in the cloud focus, and um, you know it's gotten a little bit easier to find female speakers and, and experts and see yes. CIOs. The list has grown, but not as much as we would like to it, it to have. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we, um, you know, are going into uh, sort of focusing on this today um, as a female health le leader in health IT, you know, what's your advice to, to women in those roles that are aspiring to sort of leadership in, in this field? Yeah. So, you know, I, I kind of see, you know, in my career, I see there's like two different distinct tracks for healthcare IT professionals. Uh, one of them is uh, team members that have come up through the clinical roles and started to enjoy IT from the perspective of being a user, being a super user, wanting to understand more about how the systems interact and integrate with each other. Um, a lot of our team members in corporate IT right now are um, clinical uh, backgrounds. Um, my background is different. Um, um, like you said, I was one of the first uh, people, females at uh, the conference 10 years ago, but I'll date myself a little bit that, you know, my college education was computer science and going close to 40 years ago for that. So imagine, you know, for every woman that was in those classes, there was probably 20, 30, 40, 50 men in those classes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I came up the traditional way of being a programmer and then started getting interested in the business end of an operational end of how hospitals work, how the IT really is supportive of uh, healthcare. So I came up uh, from it from different ways. So I think today, too, with females, with the STEM programs and, you know, so many more opportunities to enter the engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering, materials and engineering, you can come up that way. You can still come up through the clinical realms and have that interest in IT. You know, every every person doesn't need to have a desire to be a programmer to be in IT. We need those people that can be the transformation of how to use the technology in the field and that specialty. And, you know, usually um, you want that more than necessarily if you're in a healthcare system, you're dependent on vendors being the ones that supply the software. So if you do have an interest in that, sometimes the, the right career path for, uh, you know, male or female um, is to, you know, come up through those ranks where the actual programming is going on versus the implementation. So it's a lot of different paths. It just depends on people's uh, interests. But I feel like the most important thing, no matter which way you come up, is the ability to communicate and to communicate the right information to the right audience. And don't be over technical when you don't need to be technical when you need to be clinical when you need to. And and finding that combination is um, is a nice skill set to have in healthcare IT. Yeah, for sure. You've always been great at that, too. I mean, that makes you a great speaker and a great teacher and all of this um, and mentor. So and I think that is that that mentorship um, is so important. And as you said, uh, it's interesting to hear and think about how the number of roles have changed. I mean, it, you know, that innovation leadership suite, certainly within health systems and, and all of the types of organizations that support it have grown so much. Um, 
And that's led to, you know, more diversity that's not just that sort of, you know, what was that nursing informatics track versus the the programming track, although all all still available, which is great. What about, I mean, just the environment, right? I mean, you know, we talked, we've talked before about how changes to where you're working and the expectations of where you're working um, since the pandemic have, you know, have come up even for hospitals. Does that change kind of hiring practices or what you're seeing in terms of people who are available to work on your teams? Yeah, and there's definitely the pandemic really shifted a lot of things uh, to be the ability to be remote for some of the IT jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not necessarily in the hospital space on the floors and units where patient care is. So there are those opportunities that you can be a little bit more hybrid and remote. You still want to touch base with the team members that are on the ground, but not necessarily, you know, there every day. So I think it has opened up opportunities for people that they don't necessarily have to be married to a location. But I think we're all seeing even the companies that had said, you know, you're going to be remote forever. They're now changing their tune a little bit, that there is value to be with people in person and that everything doesn't necessarily get accomplished as well as people think, you know, remote all the time. You know, you look at the Facebooks and the Googles where they said their teams can work, you know, remote forever. And now they're pulling back that they want uh, some of the team members back, you know, two or three times a week. And there's a lot of pushback on that because a lot of IT people will say, you know, I'm just as productive sitting in my own environment than sitting in a cubicle that I don't interact as much as people think. So I, I think there needs to still be a marriage a little bit different to make that hybrid um, a little more beneficial for the worker and the company going forward. So I think there's still work in that space. Yeah, it's it's for sure. been it's been so interesting to follow. I mean, I think New York is a particular environment. I mean, certainly for the office buildings and office space, yeah. um, you know, and just the energy of the city. You know, I'm a New Yorker. I'm, I I miss it. I love it. You know, but it's not the same. You know, with everybody not there all the time. Oh, and the economics. You know, I I come into the office. Uh, you know, still pretty often, and just sometimes I walk home and. You know, you see restaurants not opening. They're closed on Mondays. They're closed on Wednesdays because they're they're not getting that foot traffic anymore during the day or people after work stopping in for happy hour or right. getting a, an early dinner before they get on the train. You take that away. It really has been an economic, uh, you know, yeah. hardship in the city still. And you still feel it. Yeah. And I mean, it, you know, and it with a hospital, I mean, I always thought, you know, going into this, well, it won't last in a hospital because it's such a community environment and you're there and, and that's why people, you know, go into healthcare. Have you seen, you know, changes in that in terms of even the people who are coming through the ranks or who's interested in being in healthcare? I mean, I know I worked in a hospital, it's my first job and it's part of the reason why I do what I do now because I didn't want to be in a hospital every day. It's not an easy place to work. Is that, you know, choice um, creating, you know, a different environment or different types of folks to come through? You know, I I think the challenges are definitely there. I think the pandemic exploded some of that and created, you know, a lot of what we read in the papers or, you know, podcasts, whatever the media is today, uh, you know, burnout, right? Nurse burnout, physician burnout. So um, I think there was a, an exodus a little bit quicker on some of the the older dem- demographics of some team members that maybe felt like, you know what, I'm not going to work these next three years. I'm, I'm done now. This, mm-hmm. this aged me, you know, quickly. And New York being the epicenter of the pandemic, it was you know, there wasn't a rule book and it was uh, it was incredible to see what people did under those circumstances. But, you know, it comes at a cost. It came it came at a cost for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So and then you had the phenomenon of the traveling nurses that, you know, were able to fill gaps in other parts of the country. And that's still going on. So there's definitely that balance of now budgets and finding people that want to be in healthcare because healthcare it's hard. And, you know, right. patients demand, you know, great care, but, you know, you have to pay for that great care. And if you want people to be in that space, you, you have to figure out what those, you know, equities are going forward. And I think that's still going on that some of the salary sizing and in, in certain parts of the country is, is still going on because of the pandemic. It, mm-hmm. it exposed a, an area that um, I think was probably uh, not looked at as often as it should have in the past. Right. 
For sure. I mean, I think both, um, I think it was maybe today in, in the New York Times, there's an article about teachers too. I mean, both yeah. the healthcare and the teacher side, it's just, um, it's tough. Yeah. Um, and then of course, for you guys coming out of the pandemic and coming into a very big transition, um, you know, to, to go, you know, sort of this exhausting period. <laughs> and yeah. now you've got to do a lot of um, migration and, and change. How has that been for the team? I mean, I'm sure there's also some enthusiasm and it's like excitement yeah. around the new system. So yeah. how are things going with that? And um, yeah, I think there is some enthusiasm um, that we're, you know, going into a new EHR that a lot of other health systems have. So the ability to share patient data that we don't have to be, you know, always trying to fax it from other offices, um, you know, going to the large market of that is exciting. The timelines are aggressive. Um, so that's exciting, but also a little, you know, scary at the same time, because it's a lot of change at the same time for a lot of our hospitals. And, you know, there'll be that one to two year period, give or take that it'll take for all the hospitals at Northwell to get back onto the same platform. So that creates challenges too, when some are on the old, some are on the new, you know, in that in-between period. So, but I think for the most part, people are really excited to feel like that this is, this is yet a really good chance to some of the things of clinical transformation that you take that opportunity now while you're also updating some of your technology tools. So I think it's great. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about kind of, I mean, as you know, for the 10 years you've gone through the transitions here, I mean, there's gotta be a lot of change management practices. What, you know, share with, share your thoughts and experience and kind of what you're taking from what you've learned before. Um, any advice, there's a lot of folks um, still left to make this transition. So any uh, learnings that you've had so far that you'd wanna share? Yeah, I mean, so even just in the first two or three months since we started, you know, looking at how we're going to do this, creating your change management teams, you know, sooner than later. And in, and it's not, you know, what I like, what Northwell's approach is on this, you know, we've come out of the gate, all of us, you know, it's not an IT project. It's a clinical transformation project. The IT piece is executing software, executing the technology tools that are going to be used for the clinical transformation. So shifting it typically over the years, you'd always hear, oh, a new system's going in. Oh, IT's managing it. Well, this time around, it's, you know, clinical leaders managing it. And we're just the support behind the scenes of that, which I think is great, right? We're not the ones that are using the tools. We just need to make sure that people who are going to use the tools have them. I always look at it as starting a car in the morning. I just want to put my key in the car and I want to go. So I want to turn my computer on and I want to have all my tools there. And, you know, IT's job is to make sure all those tools are there. Um, so I think it's I think it's fantastic that that shift happened. Um, and then I think it lets the clinical people know that they're the ones in control and it's not just IT doing anything. I, I want to be that baseball umpire. I want to be behind the scenes that you don't even know who I am because everything you have you need and you don't need to know that IT is um, out here. So that's our goal. I think communication, including your clinical users, including your non-clinical users, but make it more about the teams that are going to be using the technology and, and less about the technology teams that are implementing those things. They can have their own leadership and their own kickoffs and their own excitement about it, but their excitement should be more about I'm supporting this large healthcare system that's going to be able to take care of patients. And then we all still say we're all taking care of patients. This is our piece of it. Um, so I, I'm excited that that's the direction. I love that. I mean, yeah. that actually brings it all full circle, right? I mean, yeah. that, um, and also, you know, sort of the learnings that you probably had that we were talking about 10 years ago on the stage yeah. about, um, you know, involving the clinician in the conversation, and now you're having them actually lead that transformation. And, right. um, you know, that it really is all about that clinical transformation piece. So with that, and thinking about both the changes from a technology perspective, but also from the diversity and demographic perspective, what are your, you know, share any closing thoughts that you have for, for folks in terms of, you know, what you'd like to see, what you think we'll see in the next three to five years around both the you know, changing landscape of what that healthcare workforce looks like, but also, um, you know, with respect to the technology. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the technology, I think people are always going to be now talking about, you know, all the uh, the AI, you know, all the automated, you know, are people still going to, you know, have their work and not have these chat, you know, GPTs and have, you know, artificial intelligence take over? I don't think so, you know, but that creates a lot of opportunities technically if people want a technical background to be the ones creating that artificial intelligence software so people can use it but use it in the right way i think there's still going to be the push of the for healthcare, you know the right care in the right location for the right team members and the right clinicians the right patients you want to make sure you put your patients in the best location for the care so you can run a business and run a healthcare system that you know you're you know it's almost counterintuitive 10 years ago like oh my god well, what's our census how many people are in the hospital that may not be what you that may not be your total focus how many people are in the hospital it's how many people are we taking care of in our ecosystem how many are inpatients how many are ambulatory how many do we have in our referral network for our specialties it's all about that because your inpatient care is your most expensive care so you don't necessarily want to be spending dollars like that if you can be taking care of that patient in a in a you know a more uh, economic um, location but also being able to take care of them better too in those locations so i think that's going to be more of a focus for a lot of healthcare yeah. systems ours included to to look at that and to keep it in your own ecosystem because then there's some value there too that you're not always looking for new patients that you have your patient population and you keep them active in all of the options that you can provide for them and be it telehealth will be more and more i think the younger generation as they get older they're used to all of these you know phones and videos and they're not going to want like on site if they they just want you know on demand right now oh let me just let me call my doc right now i'm right here on the corner of blah 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 or i'm in my house they want that care. They don't want to be going somewhere for that care. If they can get answers quick and if mm -hmm. someone can see them right now with all the technology of how, you know, resolution of cameras are, let me look at my mole, let me look at, you know, you can you can cover so much probably in conversations that happen in the office that they can happen remote too. So that saves a lot of time and energy on both sides. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I think a lot of that is going to continue to happen. Right. And it creates, you know, more more diverse roles and, and more um, opportunities for folks to work in healthcare in different different ways. And, you know, for the health system to be thinking that way, because if they don't, it will be other care providers that take, yeah, you know, that. that provide that care. Right. Because it certainly is it's access, accessible and on demand. So yeah. but that's great. Um, I, I think we can uh, close on that because I think it's a great vision for, you know, kind of technology doing what we hoped it would do in the first place. Right. right. Which is cr increasing access, improving, uh, you know, uh, convenience and experience for the patient. And then, um, you know, hopefully controlling costs, too, because you're yeah. you know providing that kind of care uh, for less money. So absolutely. One hundred percent. Well, great, Colleen. Always so good to see you. Thank you, you so much for joining us. OK. And, um, you know, we'll see what's up on tap next. Thanks. That sounds great.